No, I, I just was seeking the Lord and, you know, and could have uh, continued along the lines of what I was sharing. Um, and, we, you know, and we, we will always revisit things because we want to be put in remembrance of the truths of the Word. And I just felt stirred this morning, um, well, for this morning, I just felt stirred earlier, obviously, putting this together, um, to uh, put us in remembrance of the importance of faith. And then we sing the songs that Lisa uh, picked out this morning, and you know, and then, then we have a, a, a word of prophecy, a tongue and interpretation, uh, not a prophecy, but a tongue and an interpretation of that tongue that says, I'm above it all. I'm bigger than that. Trust in me. And what he said was, don't fear. And so I, I have a title for uh, what I'm going to share with you this morning called Faith That Works. I just pulled this graphic out of my resources, past uh, graphics and things, and I don't know that I ever used it or not, um, but we are a faith church, and we need to be put in remembrance of the importance of faith on a regular basis. And what I had stirring in me, it, it, was, it was talked about in the coffee time. It was sung about during the song service. It was um, being, reminding us by the Lord Himself in the tongue, with the interpretation of tongue this morning, that we need to live by faith. <laughs> Amen? But faith that works. And so this is going to be very fundamental, a reminder a review, and launching from that, if the Lord wills, um, I'm going to explore that a little bit over the next few weeks. And, and so, I had already been thinking that faith that works for today and faith for our time, our times, um, next week. And so, God's setting the stage for that, it seems. We'll see where He goes and what the Holy Spirit has. Um, but... Let me open with an opening scripture in James chapter 2 and verse 20. For our young people that are in here, do you all have a Bible? Do you have Bibles? That's awesome. I was thinking that, that you Betis girls all got new Bibles recently, didn't you? And, and I know um, in the youth group in Route 210, regular attenders have gotten those fire Bibles that we got, and those are wonderful. And, and um, it's so important to have a Bible and to spend time studying that. Um, but James chapter 2, verse 20, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good one. A reason why I ask is it's a good one to be able to memorize or highlight or put a note on. I know uh, Kelsey's very, very active in doing that sort of thing, and she'll highlight a scripture and put it up on Facebook, you know, what she's meditating on. She's a note taker, a highlighter, and all of that. And these are good things. Let your Bible... Be your operator's manual for your life. In the army, in the military, we call it an SOP. SOP is the manual for doing a specific job. And SOP stands for Standard Operating Procedures. Um, we have an SOP for everything. An operator's manual, the user's manual, how to do your job. And they're, they're thick and you can go to that and find answers. Well, we have an SOP. The standard operating procedures for life. It's the Word of God. And I just want to challenge you um, to get your Bibles out and begin to read them. Pastor Lisa put that in the quote, you know, reading it. You can't read it enough. You should read it more and more and more in the quote of the day, in the, in the lessons. Everything God's doing brought this service together, this topic together. In James chapter 2, verse 20, it says, But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. There are people who, are, who will say, oh, I believe in God. I, I believe that God is real. I believe that Jesus is God's Son. But there is no 
corresponding actions. No, no evidence of that belief other than that verbal acknowledgement. I don't know about you, but I believed in God before I ever had a personal relationship with God. I had a God awareness. I, I never had a question about God's existence. There was enough of, of me seeing this, this life and what church that I did get exposed to in my childhood that I believed in God. And I believed, I, I grew up watching those, those Christian movies. I heard somebody talking about the passion this morning and how hard it is to watch that. And I didn't catch anything other than, than, than the, the, heard the passion and, and, and it make, makes you cry. And, and I can tell you, The Passion of the Christ is the greatest movie that's ever been produced to depict the life and the suffering of Jesus Christ. And that we should all suffer through it with Him. Um, I believe He ordained that movie to be made and there is a a new one coming out, I believe, um, next year on the resurrection of the Christ. <laughs> and that's going to be pretty cool. And it's not going to be quite as hard, you know, although they may show, it may launch, who knows, you know, with how the resurrection had to happen because of the death. But I cried through every movie that I have ever seen. Because the movie is making, and we are visual creatures, those movies of the suffering of Jesus no matter how mild that depiction is. The passion is the closest to reality. I'm going to tell you something. It's the closest. But not fully accurate. It was worse than even that. But some of the movies that I used to watch where there would be a few strategic stripes on them with the little trickles of blood going on there, not even close. The passion got the scourging better than any other movie ever has. And it's hard, but it's hard to see him whipped. It's hard. I watch The Chosen and where he's anticipating the cross and I cry. Because I think of how much he loves me and how he was willing to suffer. And the scripture tells us we are to care, bear the cross. We are to suffer with him. And it should bring pain to see that. But joy, because that is how He purchased eternal life for us. And it's good to be reminded. See, faith is more than a mental assent, a mental acknowledgement. It is, I believe your word. I believe. And because I believe, I respond. And that's what James is getting at. And people struggle when they read the Bible sometimes and they listen to Paul and how he says that we are saved by grace in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. By grace we are saved through faith and that it's not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So Paul's saying it's by grace through faith and that, that works is nothing to do with our salvation. And guess what? Paul's right. It's by faith. We believe. And that's what saves us. But what James is getting at is he's dealing with some people. Paul's dealing with people who are trusting in works. (laughs) Preaching to people who are trying to be religious and trying to be good. And so he answers them, your goodness will get you nowhere. But, But it's only by faith. Now, James is dealing with people who like, I believe, I believe in God, but they're not showing any proof, no evidence of that belief that it's done anything to change their life. It's producing no results. And he says, faith without works, it's dead. Your faith, what you're calling your faith, which is just your belief, without works, it's dead. Because true Bible faith produces a change, an outward difference. Can you see that? So they're talking to two different groups of people, opposite motivations and attitudes, 
And so they're dealing with the truth of God's word and salvation like two sides of a coin. If I had a quarter here, you'd have, you know, if you're looking from this view, you see heads. But if you're looking from this view, you see tails. It's a different perspective of the same coin. But it's the same coin, the whole truth. I hope this is helpful to you. I know it's basic. I know it's a reminder. But we want to be put in remembrance of that because Bible faith is not belief. It's deeper than that. Belief is part of it. But it's more than just belief. I believed in God. I believed in Jesus. I watched those movies and was even moved when I would watch those movies growing up. They played them every Easter, every Christmas. Remember that? Just like Wonderful Life every Christmas. They played the Jesus of Nazareth and the greatest story ever told and all those, those movies, you know, of the life of Jesus. And, and I've seen all of them in their movie. But you may believe, you may acknowledge God, but have you done something with it? That's faith. Faith is saying, I believe to the point where I am transferring my trust. You know, in the Hebrew, they don't translate believe. The word for believing, believe, they transfer it over and over in the Hebrew Scriptures, trust. Trust. Because it's really more accurate. It's believing in a greater level. It's not just acknowledging. It's putting your trust, transferring your trust into that truth. And then basing your life on that truth. You get it? So it's more than belief in that sense. It's trust. Let me give you some scripture. Jack James, you know, um, in the context of that chapter in verse 14 says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Well, we know faith, true Bible faith, can. I just told you what Paul said in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and that's true. But can the faith that these people are talking about save them? This just acknowledgement. How many of you know people that say, I believe in God, but there is no fruit in their life? that says, I believe in God in a way that I'm living for Him. I acknowledge Him like I acknowledge Joseph Biden, the President of the United States, um, Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister of Canada, King Charles, the King of England, and so on. I acknowledge them, but I don't know them. I don't have relationships with them. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now the example that James is giving is what I call practical faith. Um, uh, practical works. See, the, the, the works that James is talking about is not religious works, duties, and, and all of that that the, you see the scribes and the Pharisees trying to, to get at. You know, they, they believed in God, but they didn't know God, did they? They fought against God when He was incarnate here on the earth. They resisted him. They resisted his message. The works that he's talking about is where you're taking that faith, that changed life, and living it out in a practical way. Not, i got to go to church today. I tell you what, I did not feel like coming to church today, Jane. And I got off early yesterday. I wasn't wore out from my route. I was home at 4 o'clock. Yesterday afternoon. Had a relaxing afternoon and evening. I think I even fell asleep for a little bit in my recliner, James, and had a nap. Went to bed relatively early. But I woke up this morning and it's just like I just don't feel like 
any energy to go to church. But my spirit says, oh, no. Arise. And something in me is my body saying this, and my thoughts, my mind is like, okay. My soul is trying to decide. That sounds good. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody else have your body tell you that? And your soul's like, it sounds pretty good. Pajamas and pancakes or something wouldn't be bad. Biscuits and gravy. Cup of coffee. Watch Journey on the live stream. <laughs> or not. Maybe watch John Wayne. <laughs> Read a book. I'm a lot more into reading than loving reading and reading and reading. More than ever. By, you know, uh, there's a principle called leaders or readers. And, and I've just been you know, actively engaged in more reading than ever. And I've always been a reader. I love reading. And, uh, and so I'm usually doing that. And um, my body said to do that. But my spirit's like, God can do something special today. And I don't want to miss it. Something good is about to happen. Remember? <laughs> Was it Oral Roberts that used to say that? Something good is about to happen. I'm trying to remember if it was Oral or if it was uh, R.W. You know, um, but Oral was like, something good is about to happen. And it could happen in this very place right now. We used to sing, and he sing that, something good. <laughs> and that's, that's that life. See, see, faith will take you into the practical. Not I have to go to church, but as I was talking to the kids this morning in a humorous way, you get to be in big church today. I didn't say you have to be in big church and suffer here in Pastor Ray. No, you get to be in big church. And God is talking to you just like He's talking to every other one of us. He knew Pastor Lisa wasn't going to be here. But he still had a message and even brought a young guest to come and hear of the love of God and the importance of truly believing in a way that you transfer your trust to him, that you act on it. See, faith that works is faith that produces results. That's what it means, faith that works. Or faith without works, results. Like this, where you... Touch somebody's life and you minister to their need. Not a, I have to go to church, but I get to go to church. I want to go to church. I have to do this, but God has blessed me. I'm privileged to be able to do this, that sort of thing. As we continue in verse 18, James chapter 2. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith. This is what James responds to that question. You say, you have faith, but I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And again, it's not religious performance. It's faith-produced results. Can can you all tell the difference? Can you discern what I'm talking about? I don't want to get into trying to elaborate on that. I think it's self-explanatory. There's a difference between religious duty, there are people who go to church out of religious obligation and duty that will miss the rapture if it comes to this afternoon. They may be sitting in the church and people who truly believe and are, are having faith-produced works whoosh, disappear and they're still sitting there. Can you imagine that? A rapture can happen on a Sunday morning. You never know when it's going to happen. Scripture says we can't know. Wouldn't that be something? I heard a, I heard a a Christian uh, humorist years ago said, "When the rapture happens, I'm going to grab a sinner in this arm and a sinner in this arm, and while I'm going up, I'm going to say, you either believe or I let go.'" (laughs) Has to happen before. Before then, show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by 
my work. Do you get it? See, you believe that there is one God. He's talking to these people who have this acknowledgement. I believe God. I believe in this. I believe there's one God because, you know, some of them didn't believe in the Son, Jesus. Okay? You believe there's one God. You do well. That's good. That's a good place to start. You need to believe in God. But it's more than believing. It's trusting in Him. Transferring your trust from yourself. Living your life on your terms. To in Him and living life on His terms. In a relationship. You get it? So that's good. But even the demons believe and they tremble. How many of you believe devils, demons, devils, fallen angels are going to heaven? Nobody? Well, they believe, and they shudder. They tremble. So believing in and of itself and acknowledgement is not Bible faith. You get it? But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect. It was matured. It it produced a result. See, again, not religious duty, you know, and everything, but responding to God, who said, offer up your son, your only son. Who God had said, this is your promise, and he's... Your seed, and there'll be an inheritance through him. Abraham believed God. Can you imagine the turmoil in him? But see, he more than believed, he trusted in God. And he trusted God so much with faith, not just a belief. When the rubber hit the road, he responded. When it came time... To, to, to act on that, he did it. I don't know, maybe he believed that the same God who made uh, my wife and I have a baby when we were way past childbearing age, but he had promised it. My, you know, Sarah laughed. <laughs> I'm past menopause, and I'm going to have a baby? <laughs> He was 80 years old. He was 90. But they had a son. And they named their son what? Huh? Isaac. What does Isaac mean? Laughter. The, the idea that made me laugh. God brought the joy of laughter to my life. He is laughter man. Ha, 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 look at what God has done. Is that your grandchild? Is that your great-grandchild? <laughs> no, that's my son. <laughs> Laughter. And people that heard, this is their son, they laughed. What? Funnier than when we would go to Grandparents' Day one day, and then... Parents stay the next day with Chris <laughs> in the school. Because we had a granddaughter that was six months older than our, than our son. <laughs> Laughter. Oh, how the teachers would laugh. What? See, faith working together with a corresponding action is mature faith. That's what made perfect means. It fully matured. The cake's baked. Get it? Y'all are quiet this morning. Is, are you getting it? Maybe it's just because, uh, uh, Pastor, you know, this is like kindergarten to us. We know this. But we got to remind, be reminded of it. See, in, in verse 23 through 26, James goes on to say, And the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And that's what Paul quotes. And that he was called a friend of God. See, it's the believing God 
that was accounted for righteousness, but that, that trusting God that produced the responding action that I will do because I, because I truly believe Him with a Bible faith, in other words, I trust Him, I'll do this. And I started to say, the same God who made that miracle happen, maybe Abraham said to himself, if he could, if he could give me Isaac at 90 years old, he can raise him back from the dead. Or maybe it's like, if he did that, maybe he'll raise up. Although, that was the child of promise. So, he had a belief that, I don't know how, I don't know. If, it may have been, God will deliver some way, somehow. But what it boiled down to is, even though his mind clearly could not have comprehended that request, he trusted God and said, even though I don't get it. I believe in you. I believe in your faithfulness. I believe in your trustworthiness. And I will do whatever you ask me to do. What a display of true faith. Verse 24, you see then that, that a man is justified by works and not faith only. In other words, true faith that where you trust God produces evidence. It pres pres produces results. It works in a practical way. He says another example, likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit's dead, so faith without works is dead. So James is, is describing true biblical faith, trusting in God. Because these people needed to hear that. Not just the mental ascent. And that's what he's dealing with. So let's go over to the Apostle Paul and what he wrote in Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Boasting needs to be eliminated. See, Pharisees, religious people, boast in those works. Job, like, I don't deserve this. I'm righteous. I've always been faithful. I've always done the sacrifices. Not just for myself, but for my children. I've prayed, I've done this, I've done that. I, 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 I. I am good. This isn't fair. Boasting of your own righteousness. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. See, Paul's not talking about religious works, religious actions externally. And that's the same thing James is talking about. Not the religious duties and works, but true response. Which will do the religious things. I go to church because I get to go to church. Because I'm excited to go to church. Because it is the will of the Lord for me to go to church. And so when my body says that, I'm like, body, just get out of the way. Get up, get showered, get dressed, shave your face, go into church and brush your teeth. Right before you leave. Or is he the God of, uh, therefore we conclude a man is justified apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Because, the, the, you know, he was talking about the law, and that was the law given to the Jews. Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. And the law isn't doing nothing for them. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then make, the, make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish a law. Because in true faith, you will live that out better than anything you do of your own effort. How many of you can say amen? That when it's the motivation of the changed heart, obedience to God is easier than the religious duty, if any of you have a religious background. <laughs> Let's go over to Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. Again, he entered Capernaum after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together, so there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them, and they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. 
This paralytic and his friends heard, and, and I heard one preacher uh, recently, well, in the last number of months, said it, it, it didn't say that the paralytic had faith. <laughs> and he was talking about, and I don't know, I, I think he did. But the paralytic, you know, they, they're like, we're tired of carrying this guy around everywhere he has to go. He needs, he needs a miracle. He, we need to be free from this. So they believe, hey, there's a healer in that house. Like, I'm tired of carrying him around all the time. I've got things to do, people to see, places to go. <laughs> I don't know if that was true or not, but it was funny. Funny spin on it. Whether he was included in the faith, they believed that Jesus had the ability to heal this man. And with all humor aside, they believed it so much that they had corresponding actions. When they saw they couldn't get through the crowd, especially carrying him on this stretcher, they get up on the roof, and you know the roofs, you know, weren't made like roofs are today with, you know, uh, joists and plywood screwed into them, and then a layer of, uh, uh, you know, the roll of whatever kind of the black paper, whatever it does, you know, it's a, like a water barrier and stuff. And then a whole thing of shingles on top of that. You know, it's, it's not just a matter of tearing through that. You'd need saw saws and, you know, all kinds of equipment to get through a roof like uh, on this building. But back then, they would just have, you know, a structure and put thatch and stuff on there and that. And so they tore all of that stuff off and just get exposed to whatever cross patterns of sticks and supports they had and, and lowered him through that. See, they had a trust in ability for Jesus and they were going to get him into his presence no matter what. One way or the other. See, that's faith. Not just acknowledging, yeah, he could heal him, but responding. I really believe that. So I'm going to commit vandalism <laughs> to get this guy there. Because I don't want to carry him around anymore. I don't know. Yeah, that, that was funny. So let's read the next verse. And I made it big and I emphasize it. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And that's more important than the healing. Now, we all know the end of the story that when the, you know, the religious people who are all about religious works are all offended at that. Who is he that says, your sins be forgiven? God is the only one who can forgive sins. And that should have rung in their heart. That's right. And you're standing here looking at God. <laughs> God alone can forgive sins. And Jesus says, why do you ponder this in your heart? Do, just so that you know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. In other words, as God manifested, I say to you, paralytic, arise. And he rose. But the key is that he saw their faith. See, true faith, trusting in God, can be seen. Not just heard with an acknowledgement. Sometimes even a grudging acknowledgement. Or a, I just want to cover my bases. I believe in God. Just in case, so I go to heaven. But I'm not willing to do anything with that belief. I am not changing my life. I am not surrendering myself to His will. That's not faith. That's just a belief, an acknowledgement, a mental assent to him. But true faith can be seen. Not religious works. He was in the midst of people who did religious works and got offended at this. This was true faith. True works produced by faith. See the difference? That's the point of the message today. Do you all see the difference? I'm not going to let you go until you get it. Everybody, everybody, do you see the difference? Oh, look at those hands going up. I get it! I get it! 
Please, God, I get it. <laughs> Let me go. Let me wrap this up. Hebrews chapter 11, 6. We'll pick this up next week with faith for our times, if the Lord permits. Hebrews eleven six. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is. You believe in God, you do well, that's a good start. Must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. See, He's not only someone you acknowledge, but He's someone you can have a relationship with, and He will prove Himself and, and work through you and show Himself mighty in your life. He will reward you. For that relationship, that faith, that trust, more than a mental assent. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is invisible, but Jesus saw their faith. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand the worlds were framed by the Word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. Faith is invisible. It receives, it sees the eye of faith as that promise as yours before you ever see it manifested in real life, in the flesh world. That's why you hear when I pray, and I try to be very specific in my prayer, not perfect in all of my walk with the Lord, but in my prayer life and when I'm praying and believing, I pray for a manifestation of what was already happened. That happened earlier in the service. That they would see the manifestation of what you already did 2,000 years ago. We prayed for them. We believe for their healing. Now we're praying for that manifestation of what they have already received. Because see, you've got to receive if faith. You receive it before you see it. It has to be as real or more real to you that I have it now before I ever get it. Because then, then that's not faith. Faith is unseen. But it's so real that you receive by faith the promises of God. How many of you have seen heaven? Have you seen the mansions? What? Nobody? Nobody? Why do you all believe in heaven and that you're living your life based on going there if you've never seen it? That's faith. I believe in something that I cannot see. And my mansion is real. That dwelling place He has made for me is more real than the house that I'm going to drive home to this afternoon. And oh, how nice it is. And what really makes it awesome, it's in his neighborhood. <laughs> I'm his neighbor. And as we learned, you know, that the, that the mansion, the room that built in the wedding, in, in Galilean, Judeo, and Galilean, especially culture and times, was it was an addition to the father's house. So I'm not only his neighbor, I live in his house. I'm just a room an expansion in his house. Customized for me. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and I'm going to close with this today, I believe. I was going to do another one, but Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and this is where I was saying it's, trans it's translated instead of believe, trust. Faith is translated trust. Trust in the Lord. In other words, believe with Faith. Trust is the great accurate word. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. See, it's a relationship. When you go beyond mental ascent and you trust Him like Abraham did that says, I don't get this, but I trust you, sir. And I'm going to do what you've asked me to do, even though my heart is breaking. And he was so in trust of God, so in faith. It's like, okay, God hasn't stopped me yet. And he had his hands up and ready to plunge the knife. 
And God says, wait. And provided the sacrifice. And he did that for you and me through Jesus. He is someone we can trust in. Bible faith. That will produce the action. If I truly believe with Bible faith, you will be able to see that in how I'm living my life, what I'm doing. Not religious duty, obligation, mechanical and external, but a heart-produced response. Do you get the message today? Good. Then you get to go home and have lunch. (laughs) You're so quiet today. Maybe y'all are going to go home and have a nap. Uh, Whatever you're going to do, let's close in prayer and let you go do it. Father, we thank you so much for this message today. The reminder that that faith works. It produces a corresponding action. True biblical faith is a response to you, a trust in you that is absolute, a trust in your word, in your promises, that we will put our confidence in that and not let anything sway us from that truth. We will live our lives based on that. And the result of it is, when we do that, you will direct our path. You will, re- In other words, we will have a relationship with you where you are guiding us and, and giving us the direction for this life. And we thank you for it. Our good, good Father. Our good, good Father. We give you praise for it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I've got two minutes. If there's anyone in here or who is listening to this message and you have not put your trust in Jesus you have believed in him and it's a good start you've acknowledged that he's God but you haven't given your life to him if you want to surrender your life to him if you're in this place come up to the altar and I'm going to pray with you just be brave and be bold and say I want to show that I'm trusting in Jesus for my salvation I'm trusting in Jesus with the rest of my life then run up here real fast and I'm going to pray with you And if you're watching this message, you can pray that prayer. There's no distance in the Spirit. All you got to do is transfer your trust from yourself into Jesus Christ alone. No longer trusting that you're going to make it to heaven on your terms, but that you're going to make it to heaven based on His terms. Okay, I I take it nobody in here is not saved um, or not ready, and so I do believe there may be people. So I'm going to say a very short prayer. And if you'll believe in your heart and pray this prayer, from your heart, you'll be saved. Father, I trust in you. I go beyond my belief in you to a willingness to transfer my trust from myself and my own goodness, my own righteousness, to you, to the righteousness that was lived out through your son Jesus that we read about in the Bible. I believe that your son Jesus is truly that, your son. He is God. And I accept him as God. I accept him as my Lord and Savior right now. Meaning that I am going to trust in him. I'm going to trust in his righteousness applied to my life rather than my own. And that from now on, as my Lord, I will live for him. I will live out my faith, my trust in you, by serving you. I believe in you. I receive you. And because of it, I'm saved. I'm a child of God. And I give you thanks for it. I am going to go to heaven and live with you. And I praise you for that, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, whether you're in here and we're just scared to come up or you're watching this, I encourage you to do something. For the next 21 days, Open, up, get a Bible, open up the book of John, the gospel of John, and read one chapter a day for the next 21 days. And you'll get to know your Lord and your Savior better.